Do ghosts call getting ghosted getting humaned? What if the Earth isn't just flat, but it's a cube? Answers to these questions and more on This Paranormal Life! Hello! And welcome back to This Paranormal Life. It's Tuesday. That is the time of the week when this comedy podcast uh, comes at you with a brand new tale. We have to decide by the end of the episode whether or not it's truly paranormal. My name's Kit Greer Mulvena. I'm sitting across from Rory Pars. How the hell are you doing today, Rory? Doing pretty good. Let me tell you, the setting is right to investigate the paranormal because while we sit here in our cozy little studio, there is a apocalyptic style storm raging outside of our windows. I don't know if you can hear the rain blasting down. Uh, but it's so severe that I believe the government just had to put weather warnings in effect. <laughs> We're recording right in the middle of Storm Debbie. Debbie is cruel and Ooh. she is loud. Uh, we've got a skylight here in the studio and it is smashing against it. Um, hopefully, using the power of um, audio cleaning technology, you're hearing none of it. Right. I have to catch a flight in a few hours, so I am a little bit worried at gale force winds and thunderclouds uh, rolling in. So, you know, if uh, if you ever want to do an investigation in the future on uh, ghosts, maybe I'll be the one that you get in contact with. <laughs> you know, me and Rory are a little like the royal family. We never travel together, just in case the feds <laughs> bust one of us uh, I don't or think that's they why take the, that plane yeah. down. I don't think that's why the royal family don't travel together, uh, in case they get busted by the cops. After the shit they've done, it should be. <laughs> Uh, it is true, but in the country there has been a lot of uh, a lot of people are, don't have power right now. So I don't know, Rory. We better get some Heinz baked beans at the ready. We could be in for the long haul. Maybe we'll just do a podcast marathon if you get stuck here. Right. I, I'm so ill prepared for any kind of apocalyptic setting. I think I, it, it would be three days before I die. Three days wouldn't be doing too badly. I had you down for twelve hours. Twelve hours. I could do probably three days. I'm the kind of guy that would uh, go to the supermarket, roam the aisles to get a, a can of beans, and then use that can of beans to hit another man over the head and take all of his supplies. <laughs> right. I don't know how to open beans, so I'll just use it as a weapon to kill and pillage. Right. Yeah. You know, your your basic survival skills are so poor, you trade the can of beans for a tin opener, and then afterwards <laughs> you're like, ah, shit. <laughs> I'm like learning skills, but to do the wrong thing, like an old man will teach me how to make a fire. And I'm like, oh, this will be great for burning the evidence of the crimes we commit. <laughs> right. Now that there are no laws anymore. And he's like, I shouldn't have taught you how to make fire. Right. You, you know, you break into a supermarket in the zombie apocalypse and just take all the kind of valuable goods as if you can sell anything anymore right. when you should have been taking medicine and food. <laughs> The doctors are teaching me how to like sew up wounds in case anyone gets injured. And I'm like, yeah, this will be really helpful to sew up the little mouths of the complainers in my group of survivors. It's like, this is awful. You know, uh, you say we're not really cut out for it, Roy, but I think actually we are perfectly cut out for the apocalypse because as paranormal investigators, we already know to trust no one. Right. That's the first survival skill of all. You know, if you're holed up in your house, shotgun pointed at the door waiting for zombies to break in you know there'll be people knocking the outside going like uh ambulance here we're we're taking survivors to uh, the commune where we're gonna live and prosper is there any survivors here i'm gonna shout out like oh hello satan you little liar oh yeah there's a survivor in here please come in and help and i'll have a 12 gauge <laughs> ready for them <laughs> because i trust no one. Oh yeah look as paranormal investigators we were born with mistrust oozing from our bodies. Even as a baby, if my mother so much as tried to give me a bottle full of milk, I would slap it out of her hands and say, get that poison cream away from me, you harlot. Oh my God. <laughs> you don't want your baby boy to survive, mother. I was starting to see why you were adopted, yeah. Also uh, incredibly malnourished. <laughs> But Rory, uh, I hope for the love of God that we are able to make it through the next 60 minutes or so uh, unscathed by the storm. Right. Lord knows, even if that skylight gives out, even if this room starts flooding, we're going to continue to bring you guys the truth. We're going to continue to podcast um, even up to my dying breath because today's story cannot wait. It has to be told 
even though it is a very old story, I will say. It's a yeah. story that's quite well known uh, and does not rely on us telling it, but it is a fun one. It is a fascinating one. Okay, I am ready to get spooked. Okay, Rory, you might live in London, but uh, imagine living in London and cast your mind back uh, almost a hundred years to the 30s in London. Okay, I, this was a classy time, you know, guys in suits, uh, driving around in those old cars that went Aoga! when you pushed the horn. <laughs> yes. You know, it was an exciting time to be in the city. Right. You would, you know, in one of those cars, you would drive by at four miles per hour and people would scream at you like, slow down. Yeah. Slow down. You're going to kill someone. Probably no seatbelts. So four slash five was kind of the fastest you would go. It's an excellent point. It was clearly a London that looked different to London now. I don't know if Rory would have survived uh, back then on those streets. I don't know how many kind of pizza spots and gaming bars there were. Hey, you give me a tin of beans, brother, and I can survive anywhere. It's the other people you got to be worried about because I'm hitting them with the beans. <laughs> We've made that clear. Okay, made that abundantly to, clear. I want to make it clear as everyone knows. Hard cut to Rory in the dock defending himself for attempted murder. It's like, and the defendant was seen at the scene of the crime holding a pretty badly dented tin of beans. <laughs> the judge is like, you're obviously guilty. We're going to send you to the electric chair. Ah, oh, that sucks to hear. Uh, for my last meal, though, <laughs> could I just get a hard tin of and beans, your honor. <laughs> Get him out of here. <laughs> I'll kill you. That's right, we are in 1930s London and the acting company at the iconic Old Vic Theatre in Waterloo are preparing themselves for the opening night of their latest production. But on this night, what should have been an exciting time was instead strange and sad because of some recent events. Namely, the tragic death of Lillian Bayliss, the theatre's director. Just a few days prior, Bayliss had fallen down, exhausted, and died of a heart attack right in the middle of rehearsals. Oh! Which, unless they had been rehearsing stomp for 13 hours straight, uh, that would not normally be something you would expect to happen in a theatre rehearsal. Yeah, it's always scary if something serious happens while rehearsing for a play or a musical, because sometimes the thing that happens is also what's supposed to happen in the scene. You know, it, it's like uh, here where we grew up. I remember there was a performance of Jesus Christ Superstar where one of the main actors was uh, supposed to be hung at the finale by a rope. Fortunately, something went wrong and I think he was just hung. Okay. <laughs> and so everyone watching the performance is like, my God. God, he's really going for it. He Look, he took out his uh, a pocket knife. He's trying to cut the rope down. He's like screaming for the director to help. He's breaking the fourth wall. This right, is crazy. He's taking it to new heights. Uh, luckily, he was fine. But uh, yeah, you just have to be careful because when there's dangerous things happening on stage, sometimes they're also just happening in real life. But despite the theater director having died very recently, the night must go on. And on this night, the star of the show sat pensively in his dressing room. Sorry, someone just died of a heart attack during rehearsals and they're just going to continue like nothing happened? <laughs> Didn't you hear me, mother <laughs> The show must go on. Listen, I don't care if someone died. People paid at least a few pounds for their tickets. Rory, all I'm saying is we just finished a live tour. If you had died... Best believe the show would have gone on. Well, you would have rolled me out like Weekend at Bernie's? <laughs> Controlled me like a meat puppet? I don't know what I would have done. All I know is I play by the rules of theatre. Which are? The show must go on. <laughs> okay. That's no the only what. rule I know. I think the idea was maybe if this had been the leading man or something. Sure. They might have not done it because that would have effed the show. Been kind of hard to do, yeah. I think at this point, I don't know how theatre works, but I think the theatre director dying days before the opening night, their job's kind of done. <laughs> okay, the show's ready. That's a horrible way to look at it. But, you know, but what's the theatre going to do? Just go out of business? Uh, they got to kind of put bums in seats and uh, run the show anyway. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it's not a great attitude, but sure, why not? <laughs> and I'm sure nothing will come back to bite them 
on the ass. As I say, the star of said show is sitting pensively in his dressing room. That's your five minute call, Mr. Olivier. Startled out of deep thought, the Laurence Olivier, considered to be the greatest stage and film actor of all time, responded, uh, thank you, I'll be right out. Mm, kind of interesting that you cast yourself as mm -hmm. the the legendary greatest screen actor and stage actor of all time with, you know, charming and impeccable performance. And uh, I'm the, what did you say, the, the Cockney stagehand. Yeah, that, that guy is a bin man. Uh, that he, seems irrelevant to the story. Yeah, he moonlights as a stagehand. That seems unnecessary to include that, right? But maybe guy, maybe my guy's like a budding actor. Like one day he he's actually like kind of a genius. Nope. <laughs> yep. Just. Uh, but he has a hidden talent, though, right? No, he's actually fallen on hard times, and that's why he's taking a second job as a stagehand. I see. Which will nope. make that redemption I, I all really, the sweeter. I don't you know? really care for the for the for the arts, <laughs> me. Waste of money, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. That's what he thinks. Which makes it even better when, presumably towards the end of the story, he realizes he was wrong and becomes a star himself. Uh, he actually, well, it's actually, I didn't include it in the final script, but he actually, right after this, he uh, got his cock and balls stuck in the <laughs> okay. in the elevator door. <laughs> How? And, and, oh! <laughs> you know, kind of, a kind of comical, yet ridiculous, yet tragic end. For that character, he actually incredibly short lived. I think we probably don't need to include that in the story then. Whereas, well, I didn't, but you asked me what <laughs> happened to him. Whereas, uh, Lawrence, you know, it is funny, you know, I we all know of him, obviously, he's quite famous. And the more I read, the more I kind of saw a lot of myself in him. Any per parts particular? Truly the greatness. Okay. The, the, and also the humbleness. Is that a word? I don't think so. You're not being very humble currently, Humility. I would say. I would say. Uh, but, you know, I haven't heard enough of your performance yet. I'm willing to hear it out. You know, I've never stepped foot on the theatre stage, uh, but I've just always felt that if I did, I would be the goat. Right. So you've never performed once in any capacity no, on the never. stage. Yeah. But or I just, I watched videos of Lawrence do it and it doesn't look that hard. Because he's incredibly talented. He makes it look really easy. Yeah, that's a skill which in itself. Which it is. <laughs> it's only extra weird because you, in the past, I think on multiple occasions, have gotten your cock and balls trapped in an elevator door. So it's like, it feels like if you right. were any character in the story... I just don't see story, how that would be relevant. Yeah. Yeah. It happens to a surprising amount of people every year. I don't know. I think it's something like six or five people a year in the world it happens to. It's not that so many. So for it to happen to me twice in one year is like not that weird. It's, you should have learned. You should have learned from the first time. Lawrence is slow to gather himself. I guess something about Lillian's sudden death goes beyond a simple tragedy. He feels uneasy and easy to understand why. Because backstage amongst the crew and amongst the actors, they have one thing on their mind. It's the curse. Someone ain't been careful with their choice of words. Something else bad is gonna happen. I can feel it. I knew no good would come of this production. Well, later that night, Olivier is on stage and true to form, he's captivating the audience. My thought, whose murder yet is but fantastical, shakes so my single state of man. That function is smothered in some eyes and nothing is but what is not. He was finally able to shut out the superstitious thoughts and doubts when, just then, a clattering is heard above the stage. Directly above Olivier, a 25 pound counterweight snaps, tumbling past the lighting trusses and hurtling directly towards him. But he sidesteps as the weight smashes onto the stage. The audience and cast are stunned. As the dust settles, the whispers in the audience return. It's the curse! It's the curse! You see, Olivier and co. weren't performing just any old play that night. They were performing what the superstitious amongst them would call the Scottish play, more commonly known as Macbeth. Ooh, all right, one of the greats. Yes, today we will be investigating William Shakespeare's medieval masterpiece and the deeply held belief particularly among actors, that it's cursed. 
If something goes wrong like that in a play, and one guy backstage starts going, it's the curse, it's the curse, <laughs> just arrest him now. Because I'm going to think that immediately he cast the curse. <laughs> and he's actually kind of excited that it's right. working. Does he have a smile on his face? Right, yeah. Yes. You know, I'm also worried for anyone who, you know, because we've worked backstage at these kind of things. Hell, you've worked on stage at these kinds of things. I have. Uh, whenever I've worked backstage at this kind of stuff, I didn't give a shit about what was going on. I was a bit like the guy getting his cock and balls stuck in the lift. I didn't care about the show. I was just there because it was a job or whatever. Right. And Terrible attitude, by the way. That's not the... Don't give a shit about the arts, uh, yeah, really. This isn't the opinion of most stagehands. I would say most commonly stagehands do care about the performance. Uh, they actually take, enjoy the craft. It, to be honest, if the whole thing got cancelled and I just got paid, that would be ideal. Catch kid in the rafters loosening ropes and weights <laughs> before the performance, hoping he could take out one of these f***ers and get an early night. What I'm saying <laughs> is, if you get the text being like, Hey, we need some extra help on this production. Do you want to hop in and do a few shifts this week? Yeah. Uh, here's the show times. If you then turn up and you're like, you know, doing doing the job for a few hours and sure you're enjoying yourself. And then you hear someone crying saying, it's the curse. It's the curse. I'm starting to regret signing up for this job. Right. Because I might not have known that there was a curse, that someone is going to get hit with a Looney Tunes anvil and it could be me. Yeah, maybe these companies are calling people up being like, we need a, a few uh, sacrifice volunteers right. for the performance. Uh, if you guys could just stand over here on this red X and we'll get everything underway. Yeah. Uh, one question. I was noticing online that you were advertising this, this job is paying twice what every other job is paying. Is there any reason for that? Yeah, uh, we just think you guys deserve everything. Uh, you know, for your short huh? time left on this earth. <laughs> oh, right. Okay, you, you never know short when time in the theaters, so it's a short run? Oh, it's a real short run, buddy. <laughs> okay. You're going to reach the end of your performance tonight. <laughs> uh, I agree, though. I, I think this story just goes to show just what kind of, like, just how on edge everyone was feeling if as soon as something happened, people are whispering, it's the curse, it's the curse. Yeah, don't do the show. <laughs> If that's a situation that can arise. Rory, how much do you know about Macbeth? Uh, very surface level stuff. Okay. All I know is you don't say it. Huh? You don't say the the name of well, the, tell the show. Tell me that earlier, <laughs> bud. No, but you're not supposed to do it if you're performing the show, I oh. believe. Or maybe just in any theater, it's bad luck to say Macbeth before any performance. I'm not entirely sure how much it's spread, but the idea is just uttering the word curses the performance and means that an ill fate will befall the members of the, the cast or individuals in the theatre. That is exactly right. This is probably one of the world's most famous curses. There's a lot of famous ones out there. The curse of boy King Tutankhamun and his uh, tomb, cursed diamonds and things like that we've covered in the podcast before. But this is one of the most uh, widely known now, it is one we have talked a bit about on the podcast before. Uh, I think probably when talking about other curses or other curses in the context of theatre and production and stuff like that. But sure, sure. It was one that I felt deserved closer examination because this uh, play is so famous. That's right. Shakespeare's Macbeth goes by many names. The Bard's Play, The Unmentionable, Harry Lauder, or as we've heard just now, the Scottish play, all imaginative alternative titles for Macbeth. But why? Well, as we know, Rory, people working in theatres are a superstitious bunch at the best of times. And it turns out there are actually many rules of theatre world that I have to say I had no idea about. But hmm. Rory, you're a lot more experienced in theatre than me. Do you know any other theatre rules? I don't think so. No, as in like, supernatural ones essentially aside yes aside from the normal rules of society such as don't kill people don't steal those yeah. are all the normal rules of the world but there's theater specific ones that are superstitious uh not that i know of which is worrying because i've been in a lot of performances that have gone very wrong right. so i assume i was triggering them left right and center right rory was backstage smashing mirrors and walking <laughs> under ladders <laughs> Uh, well, why don't I give you a couple and you can tell me whether you've heard of any of them. I was taking delivery orders before the performance being like, who wants a Big Mac, Beth? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, shut the f*** 
up. We're performing cats and you still managed to say Macbeth? <laughs> <laughs> All right, theater rule number one, never whistle. Uh-oh. <laughs> that can't be one. I feel like there's performances where people whistle on stage. Probably, but uh, those actors don't last long, maybe. Jeez. Uh, that's not one I knew about at all. And that is a rough one because, as I say, I was, you know, backstage, theatre hand, whatever. I'm definitely walking about like a builder, like... Yeah, you know. The show tunes are catchy. Yeah. Um, so that's a disaster. Right, number two. Never say good luck. Instead, say break a leg. I did know this one. And right. I'd kind of forgotten about it, but... It'd be interesting to know where the, where the history of this one comes from. Um, there's a lot of kind of popular but probably not true theories. According to Wikipedia, the most uh, realistic one is that there's a phrase in Yiddish, which I won't try to uh, pronounce, but it, it means success and blessing, and it's a way of saying good luck, mm -hmm. um, which in German, they turned into a pun, uh, which in German means neck and leg bone break. <laughs> That's not funny. Uh, so I guess it's a fun little, it sounds like the the Yiddish uh, phrase for good luck, but it means something completely different it in German. Feels so broken, yeah. And then they translated it into English. Either way, I think the point is that in a theatre context, it's probably less to do with the actual phrase itself and more the fact that there's not a superstition around saying good luck because you can really easily imagine where this one's come from, right? That, you know... You do enough theater productions where, you know, you say good luck to someone right before they go on stage, trip over their shoelaces, take the whole curtain down with them and kill someone in the front row. Yeah. And then forevermore at that theater, no one's ever allowed to say good luck again. Right. And so they instead just they just just took another phrase instead. I, I'm here for it. I quite like break a leg. You know, it sounds like it's a cool thing to say before someone does a performance. I think we should experiment some other ones, you know. Spank an ass, <laughs> snap an arm, break you, a nose. You can kind of just say anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, apparently, among professional dancers, instead of break a leg, they say merde. What does that mean? Shit, <laughs> in French. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Shit. <laughs> in Spanish, apparently, they say mucha merda. What is uh, that? Lots of shit. Why? In Portuguese, muita merda. Uh, lots of shit, but in Portuguese. Um, I really didn't see that coming. And even in Russia, sometimes instead of saying good luck, they would say, go to hell. Wow. I mean, that's pretty interesting in itself. It's not limited then to theater, but clearly in theaters, that's, this is a quintessential one. Wow. So like all those years of performing at high school, my parents were actually cheering me on. Like when I asked them if they wanted to like come see me oh, what perform, do they say? go to hell. We'd rather die. Are your parents Russian though? Well, they were they were rushing out the door, let me tell you that. <laughs> they didn't want to stick around for their little boy's big debut. Yeah. That's actually really messed up. They said go to hell when yeah. you asked them to come to see you live. But you're saying it's like it's a it's a Russian tradition, so like Yeah. We'd rather die. You live in You mean nothing to you're us. You're from Northern Ireland. Yeah. This no, means like no, that no, means no, like no. we that's, do love you. I'm searching this that on the Wikipedia great. page and that's not coming up for any country or tradition. Okay. We'd rather die. Is that what they said? Yeah, but again, I think it's like a funny, playful thing, didn't you say? I know they said. Maybe they were at the back row and that's why I couldn't see them. Even though they had reserved seats in the front row. Maybe they were at the back. They didn't want to yeah. put too much pressure on their little boy. You know? That's cool. That would be weird. Why would they Why would they buy seats? That's actually so f***ed up that they would buy seats. Take up space in the front <laughs> row, which is the only row you can see, and then not go. I think it was, maybe that's a tradition. Polish or something. Yeah, but your parents aren't Polish or Russian. So. They're multicultural people. They can take parts from Are other they? cultures. Uh, have your parents ever eaten a f***ing hot dog before? Oh, that's weird. They have? I didn't know they were from New York City. You can do shit from other places, I don't think kid. hot dogs are even from New York. My parents love me, is what I'm saying. And they made it pretty clear when they said, go to hell, you little demon. <laughs> You're like, can you look up this one? Uh, kill yourself. <laughs> Because I got that nine times a day, whether I was in a theater production or not. <laughs> what culture is it polite to block your son's phone number? I'd like to know about that one. That'd be pretty interesting for me. <laughs> I can tell by the tone of your voice, you don't think 
that they loved you anymore. <laughs> okay, what about one more rule of the theater? Never bringing a peacock feather on stage. Were people doing that a lot? I don't know, that seems to me more like a vaudevillian kind of, uh, you know, like dancing girls, you know, with the peacock feathers. Oh yeah, I was thinking more like Yankee Doodle type performance with a feather in the cap maybe, but yeah, you're right, maybe more of a dancer vibe. And lastly, this one's mad. You always have to leave the dressing room left foot first. I did not know that one. That is just so unnecessarily problematic. My God, how many times are you coming and going from the dressing room? So the implication here is that all of these things, while very, very different, all kind of have the same effect, which is they just create a negative kind of atmosphere where things will go wrong. That's right, which really makes it sound like performance is just some kind of tightrope walk where absolutely everything is about to go wrong and we are barely containing all the tragedy uh, during a performance. But I suppose, again, you sort of know where this comes from because, Rory, we just did a theatre tour. A lot can go wrong. I guess that's the point, is that when you're doing something live with lots and lots of people, stuff is bound to go wrong. And so I suppose people start to get in their heads about that things are doomed or cursed and that really you get a kind of negative mindset about performances. Oh, yeah. I mean, even in our high school performances, there was always stuff that was going wrong because it's just the nature of the art. As you said, it's a bit of a tightrope walk. I remember when we were performing uh, Les Mis in high school, you know, for example, a teacher handed me a gun with a blank in it and explain to me that the gun had a blank in it while I was about to go on stage. I didn't hear a goddamn word they said. So I'm holding a loaded rifle and halfway through the love scene that's taking place where there's a <clears throat> duet between the two protagonists, you just hear in the middle of the song, bang! <laughs> From the side of stage, I fired that gun in a very tightly packed crowd. <laughs> oh, Rory has to go out on stage for his big song of the night and all he can hear is <laughs> which wasn't my key by the way <laughs> worrying my ears are so blown out even by the time I get on stage there's people you know acting out the scene there's talk of a revolution brothers we need to act now I walk on yeah I heard it's getting crazy out there they're like Rory you're f ha yeah <laughs> my ears are blown Jean Valjean where to next <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> to the barricade, I think. What did he say? Did he ask me if we were going to the barricade? Line! <laughs> they're, big, they're giving you the line, you can't hear it. Line! <laughs> uh, a lot can go wrong and will go wrong. Hey, we were in a production of Beauty and the Beast together where yep. Rory was the beast. I was not the beauty. I paused there dramatically. I was simply a townsperson. I remember going out one night and one of my many background roles in that production was to be one of the townspeople at the beginning, you know, hello, do 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 All the townspeople songs, yeah. wandering around, I'm leaning on a fence and, you know, singing along. And, uh, you know, I've been instructed to, as one of my little prompts, is to like, oh, pretend you're leaning on a fence and uh, chewing on an apple, you know. And they were like, <laughs> just, just you know, you can have it in your hand, uh, but just you don't have to obviously eat it. Just act it. <laughs> you sure, <know>? yeah. <laughs> and, and then, you know, maybe a couple of nights in, I'm like, you know what? I'm actually pretty hungry. So <laughs> I'm going to take the apple out. But I'm actually going to f*** with the script a little bit and actually take a bite. Really go method as this, little background actor yeah and in the middle of the song uh and this is this is actually not a bit i then <laughs> three seconds out on stage lean on the fence take a bite of the apple for real choke instantly <laughs> and the song is going on and i'm like two hands on my throat <laughs> <laughs> i assume the apple was completely made of wax <laughs> You hadn't realized that even in four nights of performances. <laughs> I really thought I was so f***ing smart. Uh, <laughs> I was really hoping you were going to say that, you know, you had a simple rule. All you had to do was sing one line and pretend to eat an apple. But because you left the dressing room with your right foot first, <laughs> you fired an antique <laughs> rifle on stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, there may be many different superstitions, as we've outlined, but few plays have Macbeth's reputation for such levels of superstition. 
the general idea is that much worse than any of these superstitions, just by saying the word Macbeth in a theatre is known to be extremely bad luck. It's believed that if you say Macbeth outside of just during the actual performance of the show itself, you would invoke an ancient curse and bring misfortune to your production. Wow, okay. Now, Rory, have you met anyone who believed this? Have you talked to anyone about this? I probably have met a few individuals who even lightheartedly will kind of go along with these superstitions, but I don't think I've ever met anyone who kind of religiously believes in them. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, you know, whilst I haven't worked in a theatre for any length of time, I did work in a, an audiobook studio in London, which meant that I was coming into contact with actors and theatre actors pretty much every day. You know, a few motherfuckers with scarves were walking around, if right. you know what I mean. And I do remember some conversations around this. You know, this isn't a superstition that like, it's not like throwing salt over your shoulder where like no one really actually believes this anymore. Um, people, there are some people, small group, who really don't like saying it. Yeah. Even if it's just, out of habit. So like I said at the start, yes, the 1937 production at the Old Vic was cursed, but that is far from the only time a production of this play has been affected. How about we try a production over 400 years ago? Whoa! That's right, this is the play's first ever public performance, 400 years ago. It was a private performance for King James I at Hampton Court Palace. Holy shit! This was so long ago, that Shakespeare himself had to stand in for the actor playing Lady Macbeth because the original actor, Hal Berridge, had come down with a sudden illness before the performance and would die soon after it. Wow. Begging the question, was Macbeth cursed from its very first day? Yeah, that's cool. Shout out to Shakespeare for, you know, hopping in the role of Lady Macbeth. That's a hard one. That's a, some hard shoes to fill. <laughs> it really is. You do forget that, right? That uh, Back then, uh, women didn't perform. Even men played the role of women in yeah. theatre. And when the play made its European debut a few years later in Amsterdam, tragedy struck again. A prop dagger was accidentally swapped for a real dagger during Macbeth and King Duncan's fight in Act 2 and the actor playing Duncan was murdered on stage for real. That wasn't an accident. Huh? That was some drama between the actors. No one should struggle to tell the difference between a prop knife and a real knife, and then continue to actually stab someone once they've figured it out. I don't know if you remember what it's like being on stage. It's smoky, it's dark. Whoa, <laughs> people are passing knives around left, right, and center. They shouldn't be. So, you know, <laughs> someone puts a knife in your hand, you just let it rip, brother. You've choked on so many apples, you're borderline delirious at this point. <laughs> the oxygen deficiency alone. That would be harrowing to see on stage, wouldn't it? That feels suspicious. I feel like you're not getting away with that one, with the police. If they're like interrogating you and it's like, why did you, what, what happened here? It's like, well, I thought it was a fake knife, even though it kind of is obviously made of metal, looks nothing like the original. When I stabbed him, he screamed and said, stop, it's real, it's real. <laughs> and and kept I kept stopping. going. Sure. And it's like, yeah, it, you know, there's some rumors going around that he's sleeping with your wife. Or, oh, no, are there? Are there really? He wouldn't do he that. He wouldn't do well, that. Well, he can't now anymore because <laughs> he's is, dead. Which is nice. Because <laughs> he got what he deserved, And he was he? a little lying cheat who kept eating my sandwich at lunch. All right, handcuff him. <laughs> Handcuff him. Well, uh, Rory, you might be on to something because whilst that sounds like an insane one-off event, it unfortunately wasn't because in the 1670s at a performance in London, you guessed it, a real sword found its way into the prop box and the actor playing Macbeth was stabbed through the eye and killed on stage during Act 5's duel. What? Yeah. What prop weapon would have allowed them to put a sword through his eye. Yeah, the cr it requires a certain amount of force, doesn't it? Yeah, what what was the prop weapon? A f***ing balloon sword? Like, yeah, because we're not dealing with those kind of like kids' knives that retract when you when you hit them. Yeah. Yeah, like I would have thought even a prop would have been pretty big and hefty, right? <laughs> I also apparently don't remember what happens in Macbeth. I didn't yeah. realise that they were kind of Jedi versus Sith Lord showdowns in the finale. <laughs> I thought... 
It was a lot more chill and kind of was about kind of kings and murder and sabotage. Yeah, I thought it was like Game of Thrones level, just kind of dialogue throughout. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I I think this is part of the problem, which we kind of forget now, is that maybe this is less likely to occur today because today the actors before and after uh, the performance are, you know, on their phones driving cars. But when we wind the clock back 400 years... There was a lot of swords kicking around. Uh, that's true, yeah. So, you know, swords really were just lying in tables. People were just, hey, hold my dagger for a second. I need to go uh, to the toilet. <laughs> um, so, you know, no one was keeping track of these weapons. That's true. And only 30 years later, in 1703, Macbeth was scheduled to be revived for English audiences when on opening night. A bit like this week, Rory, right here in the studio, the storm of the century wreaked havoc across England, killing 1,500 sailors. Is it a coincidence that the night that Macbeth returns to English stages, England is destroyed by a storm? It is a little weird now that you mention it that we are doing an episode on (laughs) Macbeth and there is literally a countrywide storm (laughs) battering our hometown. (laughs) And as soon as the story began, and you started mentioning Macbeth, uh, one of our cameras just shut down. It's so true. And refused to turn back on because the battery was fried. This is the elephant in the room, Roy. Have I cursed me and you and maybe this podcast by choosing to do this story? Yeah, really worried if you have because I think your afternoon involves watching TV in your pajamas and I have to get on a flight back home. So I took out a life insurance policy against you, brother. Fantastic. Earlier today. (laughs) And I kept pretty quiet about the old Macbeth episode. (laughs) Now, why don't you check out this prop dagger real quick? Check it out real close. swinging at you. You're like, you're trying to kill me. (laughs) Even if it was a prop, this would hurt. I'm possessed. (laughs) We're not quite done talking about this curse and... Maybe in the next half of this episode, we're going to see whether me and Rory fall victim to it. Do we stub our toe or does this house crash down around us, crushing us to bits? Uh, I don't know. Rory! Rory! I'm losing my voice. Yeah, chill out. We've seen countless curses before. Uh, So far, how is this one looking to you? Is this a textbook paranormal curse in your eyes? More or less, you know, saying something, uttering something, doing something causes a a situation that it feels like things are most likely going to go wrong in some form. I'm not going to complain about this too much because any kind of problem like this means more work and more employment for people who uh, work in the world of the paranormal. (laughs) Right. Which is great because, you know, it's slim pickings out there. Unless you're being called for an exorcism or a seance or to deal with some ghosts or paranormal activity, there ain't that much work out there in the world for a paranormal investigator. So if we could actually fan the flames a little bit and get more people to believe that this is a real problem, it means more people might hire individuals like Kit and Rory to be part of the staff and the crew for these productions. I see what you're saying. So we actually, I never thought about this before. We want more curses, more cursed objects to end up in museums. We want more cursed plays to go on stage because that means yeah. suddenly, you know, <laughs> you think a hundred years ago, brother, there was such thing as a health and safety officer? No. Well, today, let's get to the stage where these movies and theater productions are so unionized. You need a paranormal consultant on every single set. Absolutely, yeah. You know, so that your leading man can't even take a shit without us going in and clearing the space with Sage beforehand. (laughs) The thing is, I am, of course, curtailing this list of things that happened to Productions of Macbeth very, very short. The tragedy has never stopped. By the 18th and 19th century, this show was commonly called Macdeath. Uh, There were stabbings, fires, collapsing sets... Uh, Every show only reaffirmed that it was indeed cursed. Even when it went overseas, there was disaster. When it opened in New York City in 1849, there was a riot in the street killing 22 people. A lot of this feels like it's not the fault of the production. How do you mean? Just riots and storms? Well, no, this riot, sorry, I didn't, I wasn't specific enough. I know where you're going because the storm, fair enough, could have, that could be an act of God. The riot was with the audience of Macbeth. Oh, okay. (laughs) The audience members went out into the street and started killing each other. They found a box of real daggers (laughs) and they actually lost it. 
But like with any curse, the key to understanding what's going on lies in why. Why would Macbeth be cursed? You know, because as we say, lots of other famous curses around the world, usually if there's a cursed diamond, it's because a guy killed a bunch of people to get the diamond. Or if it's Tutankhamun, uh, people raided his tomb, which he didn't want to happen, and he yeah. placed a protective seal on the tomb, and that's why his stuff is cursed. Really? There is only one leading theory for why Macbeth is cursed, and it has its roots in witchcraft. Oh, I wasn't expecting that today. Well, because if you've seen a production of Macbeth or read it at school, you'll know that it's very famous for its depiction of witches. Yeah, the three witches that help him throughout the performance. Which is something I could really do with in my life. I feel like I don't have any cheerleaders uh, not even my parents or my wife or my kid yeah. are really kind of wishing me any success anymore. God knows Rory's parents are telling him to jump off a cliff whenever he has something big coming up. Um, but three witches in your corner helping you navigate life? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, people always think that what guys want is, is you know, fast cars, expensive watches, you know, exotic trips and luxurious holidays around the world. What every guy wants is three witches that kind of just help him now and again and tell him what to do by mixing potions in a big pot. <laughs> right. That's it. Rory having these witches as his counsel, totally wasted. He's like FaceTiming them. They're like, oh God, not again. Yeah. Answer the FaceTime call. He's like, hey, what's up? Yeah, we're really busy. What is it? Yeah, I'm just, I'm playing Fortnite. Where should I drop? <laughs> like, I, you don't, that's not what we help with. Come on, I haven't won a game all night. I got a soft 18 on blackjack. Should I stick or what do you think? Should I, should I get hit? They're like, we could make you king of worlds. If you want, we kind of know how to do it. You're completely obsessed with gambling. This, that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> you guys, can you make like a potion that just gets me f***ed up? <laughs> That doesn't make me, like, see things or anything, but just gets me, like, kind of buzzed. Here's a bottle of whiskey. It's not magic. (laughs) Damn, you guys are great. All right, I'll call you later. (laughs) Don't. Please, don't. (laughs) I'm like, guys, I need some advice. I'm feeling a little drunk. I want to know if I should text my ex tonight. It's like, well, seeing as your ex is one of us, we're going to say no. All right. Just tell tell her I say hi, though, and then I'm thinking about her. We won't. We won't. Just put her on. Just put her on. <laughs> We're hanging up. We're hanging up. Can actually, can you two guys stay on the phone? And Claire, can you can you leave for a second? It's totally not about you at all, Claire. Guys, can you make like a fucking love potion or something? I I made a huge mistake and I need her back. <laughs> no, we can't. We can't trick a witch with her own magic. God damn it! What's the uh, point, you guys? Just the whiskey, then. So you know it's whiskey. <laughs> You know, the whole depiction of witches seems like very cool and mythological today. Again, it's like the sword thing. You've got to remember that back then, this was a lot closer to real life than it is today. Back then, this was probably pretty genuinely terrifying for audiences. Hence, probably a bit more like uneasiness about witches turning up in a play. Right, they're kind of real villains to these people. You know, at the beginning of Macbeth, there are these three prophesying witches written into the play, and it's believed that Shakespeare's witch dialogue is so accurate that he somehow accidentally wrote real dangerous spells and black magic into Macbeth. Oh, damn. I thought you were going to say the depiction of these witches was so offensive that (laughs) real witches cursed the show. (laughs) Right, right, right. Uh, Well, I mean, that probably is one of the theories, but uh, at least I think the leading one is that he invoked black magic by uh, writing it into the script at all. That's crazy. A lot can go wrong if you're doing a performance that involves witches. That's why if we're ever doing stories that involve witches or, you know, uh, writing anything that involves witches, they're always absolutely gorgeous Absolute, they're tens, basically supermodels in cloaks. Okay. Because you got to stay on their good side. Right. Yeah, they cast spells, but it's always for good reasons. Even right. when they do bad things, like eat children. It's like, maybe that, that kid was a little piece of shit. You know, I'm sure they had a good reason to do it. Because the whole point is, if you're going to include them, you don't want to piss off the witches. Yes, they're a powerful lobby. A bit like the Irish in America. <laughs> right. But Rory, we found out 
allegedly the reason why there is this curse. But the good news is, supposedly, there is a way of cleansing oneself of this curse to survive it. Okay, this is what we need. Uh, we do have some sage here in the studio that we could burn that I got from Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, so if needs be, we could do that right now if you think that we're cursed. Or are you implying that there is an actual easier way to do it? Uh, I actually don't want to cleanse us because I want to see if something happens to you later today, uh, just because that would be great evidence. And I might get a double yes in my case for that. Okay, I might cleanse myself then. No, 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 and no, no. You can stay cursed. And if anything happens to you, that's cool, right? That still works. I'm just going to take the sage and I'm going to uh, uh, no, no, don't throw take it down the, the toilet. Because I can't have you f***ing this up for me. This is a big moment great. and you're going down. <laughs> There are allegedly a number of cleansing rituals, but generally they advise leaving the room, the dressing room, or in the entire theater itself, then spinning around three times to your right, then you spit on the ground, or say a bunch of curse words as you're spinning, and finally you must quote a line from one of Shakespeare's other masterpieces, Hamlet. You read the protective spell, Thrice around the circle bound, evil sink into the ground. This is like a video game cheat code in real life. <laughs> and then you have unlimited weapons. I will say... And flying cars. I will say, uh, worryingly, it also says you then have to be invited back into the theater rather than just walking in. So it sounds as if a, a slight side effect of this uh, cleansing ritual might be you are a vampire now. Yeah, that's the only kind of time we see that pop up in a lot of paranormal cases. Uh, but uh, yes, I like that analogy. This is a kind of up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right, A, B sort of uh, cheat code. Yeah. Which I do like. I mean, it makes sense that if you are uttering some of Shakespeare's curses, you then take one of his kind of blessings from another play and say that instead. Okay, I'm here for it. But Rory, we've talked a lot about the most historical 400-year-old uh, interactions with the supposed curse of Macbeth. We talked about some of the more recent ones as recently as the 30s. But actually, there is a story that involves the curse of Macbeth, which is much, much, I promise, much more recent than you could possibly imagine. Oh my god, I can't believe it's still happening. This is a theory. It's March 27th, 2022. Will Smith has just slapped Chris Rock on the face. Okay. Is we that part of the curse or is that just a cultural touch point? We all saw it echo around the earth. It took over the news and the timeline and the zeitgeist for days. People couldn't believe what they were seeing. That if, if you somehow live under a rock, Chris Rock was hosting the Oscars in 2022 and he made a joke about Will Smith's wife, Jada Smith. Will lost it, jumped up on stage, and smacked him in the face. Yeah. It was pretty much the most dramatic thing to ever happen at the Oscars and was widely condemned and uh, probably cost Will Smith a lot of money in his career and his reputation, leaving many around the world to wonder how and why did that just happen? And before looking into the story, I had no idea this happened, and I almost guarantee you have no idea this happened too, Rory. If we look at the transcript of just moments before this went down at the Oscar, Chris Rock was talking to Denzel Washington from the stage. Denzel had just starred in a Joel Cohen adaptation of You Know What that very year. Chris Rock said, Macbeth loved it. Wow. And then what happened moments later after saying the cursed word, the show came crashing down. Will Smith jumps up, smacks the shit out of him. Or what I'm saying is, Will Smith said, keep my wife's name out your mouth. Should Chris Rock have also kept Macbeth out of his <laughs> mouth? I mean, by the sounds of things, we were lucky that there were no prop daggers floating around oh, the party Jesus. that night. Things could have got a lot more intense. <laughs> Can you imagine Will Smith jumping up on stage with a two-handed plus three broadsword? He's got a Zweihander. <laughs> ah, where'd he get that? His eyes have gone completely black. Glowing like, glowing like a Dark Souls villain. Uh, wow. I mean, that is kind of human action, I will say. Uh, it would be... <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a little bit more suspicious if you said Macbeth and then the lights went out or, as you said, kind of mm. scaffolding or something fell from the rafters. 
Uh, I think a guy just slapping another guy is kind of, I don't know if we can chalk that one up to the curse. It is a great point. As I say, if Will Smith had even gone kind of sleeper cell mode and just gone limp like a zombie and then attacked him, we might be saying this was a bit more paranormal. But maybe that one is a little bit of a stretch. But Rory, needless to say, there's been many more accounts of what's gone on with this play. And we know we have an idea of why it's cursed. What are you thinking on the topic of the curse of Macbeth? I really like it. And I, it's cool to have a, a curse like this that's been around for such a long time. You know, because usually if we're inv investigating a cursed item, the curse just kind of follows the item. And it's not that complicated. You know, to have something like this that spans so many years, has taken place in so many different areas, it's really cool. And, and it's also got a decent explanation. You know, the witch is being so accurate that just reciting the lines in rehearsals kind of activates this kind of paranormal bubble that means ill fate will befall everyone in its vicinity if it's activated by the word Macbeth. It'd be good to know how far that kind of stretches. Like if we just, because we both read Macbeth in high school. Yes. You know, it was part of the the, the chosen text that you, that you would read, the books, the literature. Um, at some point, we or the children in our class, did read the lines of the witches out loud while we were going through the book. Mm -hmm. We also said the name of the book a lot. So does that still activate the curse? Or is it the fact that that isn't a performance mean that the curse doesn't take effect? Yeah, it's an excellent point. And it probably goes to prove that just why it's really only actors who give a shit about this, yeah. which on some level doesn't really make sense because yes, as you say, Probably statistically, more people, more children around the world study this text and read it every day and talk about it openly than actors read it and perform it because yeah. there's not that many professional actors in the world. Uh, but it's only actors who really care about this. Um, and it seems to only really have an effect on performances. So that's a bit odd. It's a bit odd that it's, um, I mean, maybe that's it. Maybe the witch's curse it's only punishing actors for depicting witches in the way that they are. But uh, it, it, it is suspicious, the limitations of that curse. Yeah, you know, that kind of then makes it feel like, okay, well, maybe a bigger part of this than we think is the fact that <laughs> this is also happening alongside a performance where a hundred things could go wrong at any moment. So things were already kind of on the edge and the curse tips it over the side. Whereas if you're a kid in high school reading Macbeth, reading the words of the witches, what, what's the worst that's going to happen? You, you shit yourself in class. You ask out the girl and she turns you down in front of all your buddies. Yeah, I told you those things in confidence, bro. <laughs> My teenagers were pretty cursed. Uh, it's a good point and it probably is worth, at the end of our investigation, pointing out the more sort of rational reasons for why these things might have happened. Generally speaking, that yes, in 400 years of productions of a play, things are going to go wrong. Particularly in historical productions that will have, let's face it, rickety ass stage design and bad safety protocols. Yeah. There is also the point to be reckoned with that all this talk of the curse has been tremendous marketing for this theatre production uh, over the years. We know from being in this business ourselves that even something as dangerous as a curse there's a fine line between people being scared of that and people being massively intrigued and wanting to pay money to go see it. Yeah, and it kind of works for a show like Macbeth. The curse and that kind of the ancient side to this performance and this show, it all is wrapped nicely together thematically. Yeah. Whereas like, hey, you should go and see uh, The Lion King. Last year, the guy who played Simba got electrocuted yeah, yeah, and yeah. died on stage. <laughs> yeah. This is like a performance company going... Our version of The Lion King is so convincing that a zookeeper from nearby actually tranked the lead actor to death because he thought he was a wild beast. <laughs> it was halfway through Hakuna Matata <laughs> when the zoo worker stood up and said, I've let this go on long enough and shot a dart into the actor's neck. They're like, that's not, that's not a feral male African lion. That's Daniel Day-Lewis. He went so method that they had to put him in the back of a veterinary truck. You just knocked out Andy Circus. 
It doesn't make the Lion King seem more real or engaging. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seems like maybe you shouldn't be performing that show anymore. Yeah, it sounds like the people running it are unreputable <laughs> and we shouldn't go to that room. It is an excellent point. Rory, at the end of every episode of This Paranormal Life, we have to decide whether your case is paranormal or not with a yes or a no. Let's just do it. In the case of The Curse of Macbeth, what are you thinking? Hey, I think this is a great case. And I guess we can't say we don't have enough evidence because the performance has been happening for many years and we've seen it gone wrong many, many times. Unfortunately, as we both said, as people who have worked on stage before, uh, it's actually more uncommon when nothing goes wrong in a mm. stage performance. Uh, so we can't necessarily say that any of the events uh, in today's story are kind of paranormal or out of the ordinary. So it's a tough one for me, but I think it's going to be a no today. I'm just not convinced about this curse. Well said, Rory. It's, uh, it is the perennial problem with curses. This is why I hate covering them. I, I love it because they're fascinating, but I hate coming to conclusions on curse episodes because yeah. curses are impossibly vague, impossibly hard to pin down uh, on cause and effect. And cause and effect is what we what we need to know. If a cryptid shows up and takes a shit in your doorstep, we need to be able to prove that that was Bigfoot. But with curses, it's just all a bit like, eh, this thing happened once and that's why this thing happened. And it's like, well, is that is that why? Yeah. And that's why I'm going to have to give it a no today too. We have done some great ones. As you said, the curse of uh, Tutankhamun and Carter breaking into the tomb. Mm. We did a great one recently on Valentino's cursed ring, the tiger's eye, where ill fate befell anyone who kind of came in contact or wore this ring. But like a lot of these situations, it's really like one or two mysterious events and then a lot of people dying due to like negligence or just the fact that the events are taking place at a time where people didn't live that long. So it's always a little bit of a tricky situation. I guess now we've come to this conclusion, you know, I am going to make one last big swing for evidence and uh, Rory's got a flight to catch and I am going to try and curse his ass. So, Macbeth! Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. No, no, Macbeth, no, no, Macbeth. no. Macbeth, 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 Macbeth. <laughs> hey, I'd like a large Macbeth with fries, please. I don't like any of this. Gah, 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 gah. What, was the, what was the cheat code? Macbethington. That I can do up, down, Macbeth is... spin around, say some witchy shit. I'm going to delete it from my text so you can't read it. Jesus. Uh, yeah, I don't know anymore. I'm just going to hold on to the sage before you flush the rest of it down the <laughs> toilet. Yeah, just going to hold on to this real tight. Did you know Macbeth is short for Macklemore Bethington? Uh, that is the story of the curse of Macbeth. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, if you are a theatre major at college in America or you're a theatre studies student here in the UK, uh, sorry, you've probably butchered some aspect of this and you probably know loads about it. But if you've had your own experiences with the Scottish play, send it on in to this paranormal life podcast at gmail.com. This smells good. I've never smelt sage before, like actual burning sage. Let me smell That's, it. It's actually really good. Mmm, right, yeah. As, as soon as I handed it to you to smell, I was like, he's going to flush it down the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have given him the sage. Damn it. Let me smell that sage for a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll throw it out the window. <laughs> I'm losing my evidence before my very eyes. And I thank you to you and Friars for helping research that episode if you have enjoyed this episode and you want to hear more from this podcast check out the other 300 episodes or more in our back catalog but you can also see some behind the scenes juicy content over at patreon.com forward slash this paranormal life maybe you've listened through our whole back catalog of episodes uh there is a ton more over at patreon for as little as five bucks you can support this show making Hell it yeah. possible to make in future uh and also get a ton of episodes in return. Where I'm also doing a little uh, casting call right now to find my three witches. Uh, as I said, I think it's evidently very clear from listening to 300 episodes of this podcast. I don't make good life choices. Right. And I need a team of mystics and psychics and people with magical abilities to help guide me uh, on my journey moving forward. Expect drunk calls. Very late at night. That is going to be part of the job, unfortunately. But if, if you think that you're someone that will be interested in this role, kind of just need two witches because uh, I can't fire Claire anymore because that would obviously look like there's some sort of personal bias in there. So she is she is going to stick around, but I, but I do need two witches. 
get in touch if you think that you can make that happen. If you can make me luckier or uh, just steer me in the right direction, that would be great. Thank you. I don't think you need uh, witches. I think you need friends. I think you need a couple of friends that you just kind of, that's what normal people do. They call when they need advice. Sure. Same kind of thing though, isn't it? Like witches, friends. No. Goblins, wizards. They're all kind of rolled up into something that I only need when I'm in a bad place. <laughs> right. Okay, maybe you do need a witch because you're a bad person. And it sounds like you're going to use these friends. Uh, like I say, all those episodes available right now, along with some very cool other rewards at patreon.com forward slash this paranormal life. One of those is to get a shout out at the end of an episode. Let's get into those right now. Special thank you to Ben Tony. Ben Tony is great if you want anything phony. If you want a phony ID, phony passport, uh, a phony alibi, you know? Ben will, ben, will, ben will be like, hey, yeah, he, oh, he was with me all night. Oh, he sounds like a complete crook. Do we want this kind of guy in the commune? Uh, he's not a crook. He's a legitimate businessman who deals in criminal activity. Does that make him a criminal? <laughs> it actually does, yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. Only crooks call themselves legitimate businessmen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you also to Brandon Ramirez. Random Brandon Ramirez. Uh, he is insanely random. Like sometimes Brandon will just be like, Aruga! like just make a like, like oh, make just a makes crazy like weird noise. noises sometimes. Some sometimes he'll just like pull out a little flick knife and be like, grab a wallet. <laughs> Well, that one's a little more dangerous like, than the first one. Then that's that yeah, sounds like. And if a, you don't give him the wallet, sometimes he'll be like, ah, like, cut you. You know. He's a thief. He's a criminal. He's a yeah. No, no, you don't get it. It's all part of his thing. It's all part of his thing. Like, 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 like yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I heard the noise. Yeah, the first time. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> he, he goes ching when he sees yeah, you. He stabbed me. Yeah, he did. He did. Thanks to Amanda Romano. Amanda Romano's looking for a man to romanzo. Ah. Uh, on the hunt for love, you know. Um, and looking in all the wrong places. We're talking ditches, trenches, holes, hovels, caves. You know, Amanda, try a, a bar or an app. Amanda, I'm going to throw something out here. Maybe what you need isn't a man at all, but a cryptid. That's right. I am a, I am a big fan of, of people... Getting into relationships with cryptids. I mean, the lizard man, for example, uh, he's a buff guy. Uh, pretty, he's a lot of time free because he lives in a swamp, and no one wants to talk to him. Right. Mothman, he is caked up. Have you seen the statue? Um, just something to think about, Amanda. Food for thought, cake for thought, actually. Thanks also to Stephen Haugen. Stephen, how can you afford to give us so much money? How can you afford it? I really do need to know because this month alone, he gave us, I'm just checking the numbers here, $42,000. <laughs> Holy Christ. And I'm sure it is all, I'm sure you're a legitimate businessman, like all of our listeners, but uh, how can you afford it? I, I think we should know before, uh, before we contact the police. Your generosity knows no bounds, uh, and thank God, uh, you know, that is just a, a one-off kind of random thing, because that would be hard to explain to the authorities. Anyway, thanks also to, oh Jesus, Michael Haugen. Michael Haugen as well? My, I'm just checking the numbers here. 93,000. Oh God. This week. All right, we, we need to, yeah, we need to declare this yeah. somehow. We need to... It, Michael, we need to set up a call and figure out what's going on here. I don't know if this is an accident. Are you? Do we owe you now? How can you expect me to sit here and take this? This is money that needs to be declared. Now, I'll say if it is money achieved through crime and you do need some papers that look pretty legit, I know a man that can help you. He can mm. kind of uh, create a pretty authentic looking copy. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to everyone. We've shouted out this week. We'll be back with more from next week. Uh, Rory, another double no under our belts, annoyingly. But as investigators, we live in hope. We're going to fight another day unless the curse takes on your plane later. Uh, yeah, stop bringing that up. In which up. case, hopefully would be great evidence. We'll be back next week with a brand new paranormal tale. Bye-bye, folks. Ciao.